Hello and welcome into the latest edition of PL Express. Will this be the week that we finally get Janusz Mihalik to tell us who is going to win the title? I'm going to do my best. Arsenal dropping more points against West Ham. Of course, we're going to talk about the title race, the top four race, and also the latest troubles at Chelsea. But let's start with that Arsenal result, Janusz. And it, once again, we saw Arsenal with a two-goal lead and they were pegged back and it finished 2-2. And you know what? There's been a lot of talk about whether they were getting a little bit too confident and a little bit too cocky. And one word I haven't yet heard used yet, and I wondered what you thought about this, was naivety. I wonder if you think they're a little bit naive in this game. You know, the word I would use uh, right off the top before we start talking about Arsenal, I would use unlucky. Game's about details. I've been in this game for too long, right? I mean, Saka puts away the penalty, done and dusted. We're not having this conversation. And it's as simple as that. And, you know, I'm not using this as an excuse, but that's sometimes how the games go. Did they lose control in both of those games? Yes. I mean, they dominated, absolutely dominated Liverpool at Anfield and absolutely dominated early on against West Ham with 2 0. So, uh, uh, do they get a little bit cocky? Do the sub, you know, does the subconscious come into the game? Absolutely. But uh, peak and valleys, that's the name of the game. And that's going to happen, right, uh, to, to the best teams in the world. So I think when the tide turned against them a little bit and then came that penalty, they just got to put that away. It doesn't matter. I know that everybody misses penalty. I've listened to Arteta. I've listened to Pep Guardiola, Bayern Munich, and all the best players in the world that have missed it. But the bottom line is, you know, that's that's the one that you put away and we're not having this conversation. So that's what I would say. Does that, I think, yeah, inexperience plays a big role. Pressure plays a big role. Nobody's going to, uh, nobody's going to say that. Remember last week, I haven't given away who's going to win it, you know, for a simple fact that I've said that Manchester City almost never lose control of games. That's the difference between Arsenal and Manchester City. Now, there's been some games where Manchester City maybe weren't at their best, but they keep possession of the ball. And if they don't win, it's because they've created a million chances and somehow couldn't get through, right? Uh, and Arsenal had control of the game, but couldn't keep it. That's the difference between the two sides. Yanish, I love that you say, and I still haven't given away who's going to win it, as if you've got an answer. The fact is, you don't have an answer yet. I will be pushing you this week, so just be ready for it. I want to talk about the two penalties. Now, obviously, there was the missed penalty for Saka, but there was the West Ham penalty earlier as well. And I wonder, psychologically, which one was more damaging? Had that first penalty, with West Ham getting back into it, psychologically affected Arsenal, which then had a knock-on effect for what followed? No, the first one shouldn't, right? Because when you dominate like that and it's not from the run of play, it's a penalty, it's a mistake, it's an obvious mistake. Everybody knew it. It does happen, right? Uh, it's not that, you know, and I think at that time, if you remember West Ham, were kind of coming into it just a little bit. But no, I don't think that psychology would have affected that. I, I think that the, the one missed by Saka created that uh, uncertainty, right? That's when you say, oh, oh, here we go again after Liverpool game, right? The crowd's getting into it and West Ham all of a sudden is coming into the game. So no, I don't think the first one to make it 2-1 made uh, Arsenal nervous. Certainly the missed one by Saka did because A, you had expect him to put that away and B, he himself didn't have a really good game. One of the few players that I didn't think was, you know, on the level of everybody else. But why is that? Is it pressure? Because there's been a big debate, even among our ESPN FC panellists, as to whether the pressure is getting to them. Others are saying, no, it's not so much the pressure that we saw here. What do you think it is? I think it is the pressure. I think it's the realization of, of you know, we're getting close and 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 the game of truth is coming. And and let's not forget about that. The players will think about that, right? They want to get into that game in best position possible. And when, when everything works your way, when you think, my goodness, this is easy, that's where silly mistakes uh, happen. And then, you know, I don't necessarily think that I don't necessarily think that it's 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 that they're young, but I still think, and I've said it before, that I don't think that they have that true leader, you know, that Casemiro in the center of the pitch, that that Rodri of the, in the center pitch. Thomas Partey can possibly be the one, but I don't think he will be. He's going to be a great player. There's some very good games that he's played, but he doesn't come across to me like a leader. Shaka, I think 
it's been better since they've taken away that leadership ability or quality from him, right? Because uh, remember how he played when he was the captain and everything was on his shoulders. So, uh, you know, Odegaard is a captain. I don't look at him in the same way as I look at Casemiro and Rodri. That part, maybe that one player or two players, maybe somebody, you know, at, at the back, that's, that's still up there. They still haven't developed that one massive personality that when the times are tough takes over and settles the team. They don't have that. So it's obviously the, not the most ideal situation, but it's probably fair to say the leader is Mikel Arteta right now. And unfortunately, he's not on the pitch. With what we saw in this game, you've just mentioned Bukayo Saka as well, not looking himself. Which player needs an arm around him the most going forward to ensure that Arsenal get back to winning ways? Oh, uh... I still think, yeah, but I don't I don't think if he needs one, but I, I do think that Odegaard plays an unbelievable role on that team. I still think uh, he makes the team tick. He's just going to be more consistent throughout the game. I mean, he's the sort of player that even if it, if it doesn't seem like he's playing great, he still contributes. I mean, his vision, his passing, defensive ability, pretty good. But I think he's going to decide that. We've seen Gabriel Jesus, uh, uh, you know, coming in, scoring again. I mean, he's looking uh, just as good as he did before uh, his injury as well. So, look, this is the sort of Leicester, you know, Leicester City moment. Although, I mean, I'm not putting them in the same situation because Arsenal are three or four or five times better than that Leicester City uh, team was. But again, you know, they're you know uh, you know they have to deal with Manchester City something that Leicester City at that at that time didn't have to deal with. So we talked about you said at the top they were unlucky last week. I asked you if they missed Saliba. Would you say that they missed him this week, or do you still stay firm on what you said last week? I think they have. I, look, I mean that that combination be, uh, between Gabriel and and Saliba was good. He gives you that extra pace. As I've said, uh, uh, um, holding was good. Against uh, against Liverpool, I thought he had a pretty good game. In different one here, I think Saliba with his pace uh, would have helped. But I think you never want to break up uh, the the central uh, central pairing if you can help it. And those two have a great understanding, so he would have helped. Uh, probably Zinchenko was the bigger you know bigger loss for them, right? Because he seems like if there's a leader, or at least he tries to. And you saw. You know, the pictures uh, before the game when he was on the pitch talking to the players. You, uh, I think in our broadcast, we've seen Zinchenko in the stands probably four or five or six times, which tells you everything, how important he may be to this team. So maybe I forgot about him when I was talking about the leadership, uh, because as you saw, Tierney at fault on that second goal. I mean, not the only one, but at fault. Didn't look great. Obviously didn't play for a long time. You saw him uh, coming off because he was cramping up. He was really asking, you know, I don't want to say begging for a substitution, but there was a moment late where where he really needed to be off the pitch. All right. So, you know what I did see, though, and I wondered if you saw it too. After Arsenal's second goal, they got into a bit of a huddle and I did see uh, Granit Xhaka talking to them. And that did suggest there might be something that's a bit of leadership, things he'd spotted. Did you see that? I did see that. And 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 as I've said, I mean, he he was the captain. Obviously, he's a senior player on that team. So you need to settle things down. And, and, and I think that's a good sign. That's something that, uh, you know, wasn't forced. I think it was a real, real realization from, from not just Shaka, but probably from everybody that, you know, things aren't working. And, and look, I mean, look how far this team has gotten, right? I mean, it's almost, uh, you know, I, I hear things and I listen to to some other people saying, well, even if they finish second, uh, you know, it'll be a great season. Of course it will be. But you don't know when this is going to come around and if this is going to, this chance is going to come around again. So I think they see what's happening here. And oh, by the way, I'm not ruling them out. I, I really am not. I was really, when it was 2-0K, okay, I was ready to say, believe it or not, that I think Arsenal is going to see this through. And the reason for that, and I'm maybe less optimistic, the reason for that is, look, I mean, they're going to beat Southampton and they're going to go into the game of truth seven points ahead and could have been nine. Had it been nine, I don't care if City had two games in hand, that's a massive pressure. And I think that would have favored Arsenal. I still think that if Arsenal beat Southampton, I think they go to the Emirates and think to themselves, look, if we don't lose here, we're the champions. OK, so we have to still wait until that game to get an answer from you. Well, I think everybody's going to wait. I don't think you're going to see one normal person do that before you see that game. 
I've hinted to you, my money is still on Manchester City as it stands. I mean, this is as close as you're going to get. Be, you know, not that I want to track back, but, you know, my favorites are still Manchester City. That's okay. pretty close, no? Well, your fa so why are they still your favorites? Well, because Arsenal are now in a frame, frame of mind, you know, where they, they were two up in two games and drew games. They dropped four points. I mean, you know, if you look at form, as I told you, right? I mean, look at look what Manchester City are doing. 10, 11 games straight, six. I mean, this is the time of the season where Manchester City do that. On top of that, they have a player that's going to score 100 goals this season. I mean, you know, we were laughing. Our very first show, you asked me, I think, if he's going to score 40 goals. I don't remember if this was a season or Premier League season, but I thought you were crazy. And, and look where we are here. So, of course, Manchester City are my favorites because they've done it before, unlike Arsenal, recent history. I mean, Manchester City has been the best team, you know, over the last six, seven, eight years. Uh, the confidence beating Manchester, uh, beating Bayern Munich 3-0 and, and now probably beating Sheffield United on the weekend. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I have to look at Manchester City as a better team, better squad. Uh, more experienced team that ultimately may see this through. So that's I'm going to come close, but uh, I'll give Arsenal a chance. If they beat Southampton, this is going to be something. Hang on. Hang on. You said if they, if they beat Southampton and then they go and take a point at least at the Etihad. So even after the Southampton game, might we get a proper answer well, from they, you? Uh, this is my point. They're going to go seven points if they beat Southampton. If they go to the Etihad and get a point there, Arsenal will win the title. <laughs> okay. Let's well, talk about it. It's a big game. I mean, look, look, here I am. So we, we can, you know, I'm going to say Manchester City are going to win it. Just, okay. just so, so we get some people going crazy at Janusz. But, but no, it, it's, I have zero issues given my opinion who's going to win it because, you know, I can backtrack and this is, you know, this is television, YouTube, whatever you want to call it. But, but it really isn't. I don't think that anybody can explain to me factually why one or the other is going to win it until we play that game at the, at, at the Etihad. Okay, you've said it now, though. So right now, Yanish has said Manchester City are going to win the title. Uh, Let, let's stay with City. I want to talk about them. Erling Haaland, must he start every game until the end of the season now? Well, he does. I mean, he has been, right? I mean, he's been a clear number one choice uh, for now, so I don't see it any different. Uh, you know, the difference you and I have talked about is is how great Manchester City can be even when he doesn't. Uh, so, I mean, that's the beauty. The plan A, plan B, plan C, and, you know, whatever it may be. It's still it's still not just Erling Haaland. It's everybody else around him playing tremendous football at the right time. Everybody's healthy with the exception of Phil Foden. And think about that. When he becomes an option again, when he comes back, and we all know that he can give you such quality from the start or from the bench, and you can trust him. So at this moment, firing on all cylinders. Uh, and that's what uh, football is all about, right? Get your team playing and your players playing at the highest level when it matters. Not in the beginning of the season, not in the middle of the season. You can hide some players and Manchester City have that ability. And that's the beauty of Manchester City, that they can hide one or two or three players when they're not at their best. It's a demanding fixture list for them. We did see that obviously this was a 3-1 win over Leicester, but I suppose you could still see where there would be some concerns for Pep Guardiola. Do you have any concerns for Man City going forward and what are they? I have zero concerns right now. Um, you know, we saw Leicester City coming into it late, but I mean, he withdrew uh, just about everybody that's important. It, it doesn't really matter. The two players, if he if he decided to keep just Rodri in, and, and De Bruyne, I mean, Leicester City wouldn't even come close. That's where they lost that little bit of control because key players were out. And, you know, if you take Grealish out and John Stones, who's been absolutely superb uh, uh, coming back and playing new position, such an intelligent player, not easy to step into that midfield and all of a sudden play at a level that he does. So I don't have any concerns right now other than, you know, there could become, there could be a game that is going to be an inexplicable game where they drop points simply because they can't, they can't finish. That's the only reason uh, I see that. Uh, Bayern Munich is going to be still nervous, even at 3-0, but are they going to see that through? And and then, you know, I just, just you know, Sheffield United, I mean, it's important, but not for City, right? I mean, that competition, they can deal without, I suppose. Uh, but my goodness, you and I, after Manchester City against Arsenal, 
I'll tell you then for sure who's going to win it. Oh, you've told us now. You've said Manchester City. I know Manchester City for me are favorites, no doubt about it. And it, and by the way, as I've said before, it has nothing to do with the necessarily drop points. It's just that, um, you know, they're in such great form and they're just a better team. Simple as that. Okay, let's talk about Manchester United then. And I want to talk about Anthony here because it was his first goal in 15. Obviously, we saw him get off to a scoring start at the club. 86 million he cost, but he is still only 23. My question to you is, can he fulfil his potential? That's one side of it. And is he going to be able to step up in the absence of Rashford in terms of goal scoring right now? He can. I mean, when I look at Anthony, uh, you know, he can if he forgets that he's a star because he thinks he's a star of this team. I mean, he wants the ball all the time, which is not necessarily bad. But, you know, I think he needs to remember that he's part of a team. And the, the sooner he remembers that, I think he sometimes complicates things. That There are players open that he doesn't see very often and decides to go on the runs. And, you know, he's wonderful at that. But, you know, I think I think he'll he'll change that. I think you know, 86 million, that's a lot. I don't know how many goals he needs to score for you and I or for you to think that he's fulfilled uh, uh, the requirements of that. I think it's early. I think this team is just being built for the future. You could see that right now. I think Ten Hag is doing a wonderful job. I continue to say that. I think this team is going from strength to strength. I think this team is now for sure making the top four. There were some doubts, of course, because the, the way things sh uh, shaken up, but with... Uh, Newcastle, well, forget Newcastle, uh, but but with Spurs uh, losing the way they've lost, uh, it's all done and dusted. Manchester United are going to be there, injuries or not, because they have plenty. Um, and and Ten Hag showed me that he can make players better, and that's why I think that Anthony will either become better shortly, or he's going to be out of the team because that's what Ten Hag is going to do. What's your thoughts then on the top four race? Because there have been some stumbles in the studio, even on the FC show at the moment, given Manchester United's injuries, particularly to the centre-backs, that bigger picture, it could be a problem for them in the top four race. But then maybe you've got the benefit of the doubt now from seeing the weekend's results. Who are your top four? Top four is still Manchester City, Arsenal, um, uh, Manchester United and uh, Newcastle. Right, so that, that's... Spurs, Spurs are done and dusted. It, it's 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 over. It's not even a conversation. I mean, you you probably have your money more on Brighton and Villa if, in some crazy way uh, uh, to make a push. But but Spurs are, are done. Spurs. This is their this is their trips ahead as well. Trips to Newcastle and Liverpool and sandwiched in between that, Manchester United pay a visit. What's the chance of zero points from those three games for Spurs? Oh, I don't know if it's zero points, but I mean, just the fact that you're asking me that question tells you everything that I mean, even if they just get, you know, this is nine points, if they get one or two, you know, two draws, it's still done and dusted. I mean, they have to win two out of the three, if not three out of the three, they have an extra game anyway, on a couple of those teams as well. So look, I mean, this is a, this is a team that's, that's incredibly, you know, mentally weak. I think Antonio Conte was right in what he said in general, but he's done him a, a tremendous disservice by saying so, because I think they took it to heart, even if it's true. Uh, a manager like Antonio Conte should have never uh, uh, done that, right? So uh, maybe it's a good thing, some will say, uh, because it's a realistic thing. But what we saw against Bournemouth, I mean, that's absolutely crazy uh, to give that away uh, uh, to a team like Bournemouth. So uh, uh, no, I, I see zero reason why uh, uh, Spurs could make it top four. They they, they just don't deserve it. I mean, Newcastle and Manchester United are a better team and certainly Manchester City and Arsenal are, are as well. Let's talk about Chelsea. Frank Lampard described their defeat to Brighton as the most deserved of the three straight defeats under him so far. Many people saying Brighton are the team that Chelsea wish they could be. They really do need a whole transformation, Yanish. Uh, they do, and it's much bigger than we thought initially. I was I was embarrassed for the club, for the players, for everybody else. Uh, I mean, this was, uh, you know, here's a Brighton that's beaten them twice, right? I mean, they've taken a manager away from them, they've taken a player away from them, uh, uh, and 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 look at the way. I mean, Chelsea would love to look. I looked at that game and said to myself, just watching Chelsea play it as of late. If Chelsea were closer to relegation. They would have been relegated. I mean, the way they're playing right now, they, if they were closer to relegation, 
I don't know if they were able to save themselves. I mean, it's that bad. I mean, there's absolutely nothing. There's zero character. There's zero fight. There's zero uh, plan for the shirt. It makes you wonder why these players are there. I mean, you know, if it's not the money, what else? I mean, you'd have to imagine that at some stage you get a little bit of a bounce. You get, you know, you, you get that fighting spirit, you know, if it's against Real Madrid or if it's against Brighton or if it's against anybody. I mean, I can't remember last game that Chelsea played where you could say, wow, this gives me hope that Chelsea can get back to their ways, right? Now or in next year or the year after. I mean, I thought that maybe this, this project is going to, start paying some dividends in terms of seeing uh, some identity and where you can say, okay, next season, if they add here or there, I can see Chelsea being a little bit of a contender, at least for top four. Nowhere near that. I mean, I think this is going to take three, four, five years. I mean, this is the biggest decision in terms of a manager and direction that they take this summer. It's one of the biggest decisions in Chelsea's history. Or at, at the very least in the recent history, in the last 10, 15 years. If they get that wrong, I mean, K, okay, I mean, they have players on six, seven, eight year contract that doesn't seem to be A, good enough, and it doesn't look like they want to be there. Should we get, let's go, I've got so many questions with Chelsea, so we'll, we'll get through them as fast as we can. When you say that, is there any player that stands out that you think, I don't know if they should be there, if they want to be there, that's actually playing right now for Chelsea? And, you know, I've changed my mind in that because I remember a month ago, you know, you and I were talking about that and we we're looking at the spine and we were talking about maybe the Thiago Silva's or Enzo for, you know, you know, Enzo's and all that. And I'm thinking, now, OK, Thiago, I mentioned because he's the best of the rest. But I mean, it's not like he's been great. Certainly he's not the future. So, I mean, you can't look at him and say, well, we're going to build a team around him. Right. He's going to get another year. Who knows? Maybe we see more injuries than that. And anyway, against the best of the best, you're going to see Thiago Silva struggling as well. So he's not there. Enzo, he's one of those that I love and everybody else loves because of what he did for Argentina. But now we have to look at Enzo. What is he going to do for Chelsea? And I still love him. But, I mean, he's not a holding player. He's never been at Benfica. He really sort of became that with Argentina. But look at the players around him and the strength, uh, you know, uh, uh, with McAllister and everybody else that's that's played around him. Uh, so I don't know if ultimately, I mean, Enzo can hold that midfield on his own. If we think an N'Golo Conte can come back to his normal level, maybe. But that's even a doubt. And then when we go elsewhere, tell me a name. Who? Havertz? Not good enough for this league. He's the, you know, he's the Timo Werner. And, you know, you see Timo Werner back in Bundesliga banging in great goals. Maybe that's the level. Not a knock in the Bundesliga, but it's certainly a different uh, a di different way. Not to mention that he's playing out of position. So what are we going to get out of Kai Havertz? Probably not much more. Sterling? His best is past him, right? And he's not going to be the player that's going to be deciding games for you consistently. Who else? I mean, Pulisic, obviously, you know, he's going to be gone. Who are the key players that we're going to mention? Reese James. Okay, I'm not going to say Reese James is not good enough, but he came in and Mitoma did every, whatever he wanted to do with, with Reese James. Where, when, when Frank Lampard had to make four substitutions at the same time, right? And still made zero difference. Four players that he was probably key players that he was saving for, for uh, Real Madrid came in and made absolutely zero difference. So this is your Chelsea team where you think there's going to be some pride, some quality to play a level game against Brighton. You know, all we want to say, Brighton is a good team, but where where's Brighton ever going to go? Even if they somehow, you know, they're going to have a great season, they're going to sell one or two, three players, they're going to find great players again, but they're going to be Brighton. No more than that. Okay, Mason Mount, what would you do about his future? I like Mason Mount, but I don't think Mason uh, Mount likes Chelsea, so he's gonna he's gonna jump ship. That's that's my prediction, and you know I I, I can't blame him. Mark Kukureya. Well, he was Potter's team. I, I mean, you know, not Chilwell is a better player, right? But you know, we all loved Kukureya you know, at Brighton, but just goes to show to what I was saying, different pressures, right? That's why, I, you know, I respect, I love what the Zerbi has done. I love watching Brighton, but there are different pressures playing for Brighton and playing for Chelsea Football Club. Uh, and uh, Kukureya is a great example of that. Not good enough. Aubameyang. 
Obama Yang. Yeah, I mean that I I never understood that, right? I mean, there's a flaw in his character that prevents him to use the unbelievable talent that we saw when he was at his best at Arsenal. And I don't know if that's going to change. So what happens with Romelu Lukaku? Should they should they take a chance on him back at Chelsea? No, no, not anymore. Uh, you know, we've seen him, you and I watch him closer, right? We we both watch Serie A. I mean, hasn't had a great season. I mean, yeah, he can deliver from time to time. Uh, but at, at Chelsea, at any Chelsea, even at their best, but especially this one, you can't have a player that may or may not deliver from time to time. You need somebody that's that's consistently healthy and consistently contributing to the game. I think Romelu Lukaku is past that. As we're going to air this morning, Chelsea have actually met Julian Nagelsmann for talks. I suppose what we have to talk about who is going to come in and be the manager to actually try and work on this transformation and get Chelsea fighting on all fronts once again. First of all, what do you think of Nagelsmann as this fit? Look, I think he can. Uh, he's got a clear identity. He's had success at a smaller club at Hoffenheim. Uh, he's had success at, what was he, Leipzig, but I don't consider it a massive club. And he didn't succeed to some degree, I suppose, at Bayern Munich, although as we see right now, I mean, he was tremendous in the Champions League, won every game up until the moment he got fired. Thomas Tuchel came in, Thomas Tuchel, who's been at Chelsea. And obviously, if you look at his record since he came in, not very good at all, right? I mean, lost to Freiburg in the Cup, barely beat Freiburg. Um uh lost to Manchester City and over the weekend they drew again, right? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I think time. right. So Thomas Tuchel, previous Chelsea player, has been absolutely awful at Bayern Munich since he came in. An experienced manager, knows the league. Yeah, but we're not gonna talk about Tuchel. We, we're gonna talk about Nagelsmann. So so one worry is is a little bit, you know, I mean, he's much better than Grand Potter, but I mean, this is a massive club, massive jump. Uh he's had that experience at Bayern Munich. But I liked his identity, I, a, a clarity. He's tough. He's been managing for a long time, even though he's he's a young coach. So I think from all the names that I've seen so far, he gives you a best chance. And maybe the fact that he's been in this game as a manager since, since he was young, maybe somehow he can identify with some of these young players. And that's important because it's tough coming to Bayern Munich, right? Uh, 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 dealing with all these egos. There are some egos, but Chelsea egos are easy to get rid of because nobody on this Chelsea team, with the exception of maybe one or two that we've mentioned, should have an ego because they're not good enough. They're not old enough. They haven't won enough, in my opinion. And, you know, don't get at me. You know, I don't want to mention the Aspilicua. There are players that want trophies, but I'm talking about, you know, the new players that are coming in uh, I think that, you know, they have still a lot to prove right now. And I just wonder if Nagelsmann may be just the sort of a, a manager that can identify with the younger generation and push some of the older players because he's dealt with big names already. You don't think that a return for Antonio Conte to Chelsea would be a good thing right now? Yeah, I mean, he, he needs to go back. Look, I... I you know how much I respect him. I've liked him. I thought that his appointment was was very good. At least I I thought. But no, I I just I just don't like you know the negativity, the the style of play. It, I, I mean, I don't mind in Serie A, but we all know the Premier League is something totally different, right? And when you go to a big club, you have to entertain, you have to play from the front, you have to make players better. You can't just ask for more and more and more and more. And and in fact, I don't know if Chelsea can give Antonio Conte more and more. They've spent enough and they have to sell a lot of the players in order to get uh, new players in. So Antonio Conte, not a good fit. OK, and Manchester City are going to win the title. Janusz Mihailik has finally said it here on PL Express. We'll see if he changes his mind next week. See you then. Thank you very much for watching ESPN FC on YouTube. For more highlights, analysis and exclusive content, be sure to subscribe.